makers and, and policy makers at the university have towards the future. We also have forums coming up on meeting the Board of Governors candidates uh, on gender equity as an issue, uh, on um, teaching practices and evaluations and, and a year-end event, and there are others as well, so keep track of the forum events as they come up, um, and some of them I'm, I'm sure will interest you. The purpose in general of the academic forum is for us to create a space where we can discuss issues that are relevant to the life of faculty and staff at Wayne State. And secondly, to create also a space where there's a chance to um, have a say in policy and decision making um, before it's finalized, before we just learn about it. And some of these discussions uh, with some of the uh, uh, analysts that we have will allow us to have an input, hopefully, on policy, at least give advice or, or opinions on policy before they are finalized and set. The academic forum is organized by the council representatives of the AAUPAFT. Um, the chair is Kristen Chinnery. She's not here. Um, Kristen, are you here? Uh, if your unit is not represented in the council, uh, talk to Kristen, and, and, uh, and it would be good to, to be part of it. Um, the forum is greatly helped by Michelle Pecto, the AUPAFT Executive Director, Michelle, uh, Tammy Force, the AUPAFT Executive Assistant, and Mark Dilly, the AUP Organizer. Uh, today what we'll do is I'll ask each of the panelists to make an opening statement about how they see, where they see Wayne State, uh, where they see Wayne State currently, where they'd like to see it into the future, and the challenges that, are, that they foresee in, in, try, in realizing their goals. Um, we'll have a conversation, but I think mostly we'd like to open up the question. I, I think it's truly a rare opportunity to have this kind of a conversation with this uh, level of, of panelists. Uh, let me take a minute to introduce each of them formally to you. Um, well, I'm Haigo Shagan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Communication. I'm sitting um, at the edge of it, of, of my immediate left is Provost Keith Whitfield. Professor Whitfield is the newly appointed provost at Wayne State, coming to us via Penn State and Duke Universities. At Duke, his appointments included professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience, research professor in the Department of Geriatric Medicine at the University Medical Center, senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Aging and Human Development, and co-director of the Center on Biobehavioral Health Disparities Research. Professor Whitfield is a developmental psychologist and an expert on aging among African Americans. He has published over 200 articles, books, and book chapters on cognition, health, and individual development and aging with a focus, as I said, on African Americans. He currently serves as managing editor for the journal Ethnicity and Health, and is a longtime member of the advisory board of Wayne State University's Institute on Aging. He has served as a member of several leading organizations in the field of aging research, including the National Institutes of Health, National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Medicine. In 2010, he was the recipient of the Distinguished Achievement Award from the National Institute on Aging. Professor Whitfield earned a bachelor's in psychology from the College of Santa Fe, a PhD in lifespan developmental psychology from Texas Tech University, and received postdoctoral training in quantitative genetics from the University of Colorado Boulder. Provost Whitfield, thank you for joining. At the other end of the table is Professor Lou Romano. Professor Romano received his PhD degree from Rutgers University in Organic Chemistry in 1976. He was then a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard Medical School, where he was the recipient of an NIH Research Service Award and a Medical Foundation Fellowship. He has been a professor in the Department of Chemistry since 1980, where he currently maintains an active research program <coughs> studying chemical carcinogenesis, and DNA replication. It has had continuous R01 funding from NIH since 1983, now totaling over $7 million. He has been the dissertation advisor for 37 graduate students with 30 PhD degrees awarded to students under his direction. He has served as the head of the biochemistry division and associate chair of the Department of Chemistry and interim associate provost for academic personnel. Professor Romano has served as a member of the Carcinogenesis and Nutrition <coughs> Study Section of the American Cancer Society from 1991 to 1997, and served as a member of 32 NIH study sections. 
he was the recipient of an NIH Career Development Award, an Excellence in Teaching Award in 2006, and was selected as a Board of Governors Distinguished Faculty Fellow in 2011. Professor Romano has been an academic Senate member since 1998, serving on the Policy and Budget Committees most of that time. He is currently the President of the Academic Senate, a position he has held since 2011. Professor Romano, thank you for joining us as well. And in the middle is Professor Charles Parrish. <coughs> Professor Parrish teaches public administration, organization theory, and healthcare policy. His research interests are in comparative public administration, health policy, and gerontology. He is in the Department of Political Science. He has published on diverse topics, including comparative welfare policy, Latin American politics, aging policy, and civic development over the lifestyle. His research has been funded by various sources, including the National Institute on Aging and the Andrews Foundation. He is a former chair of the Department of Political Science and was the director of the Wayne State University Institute of Gerontology for a number of years. He is currently president of the Wayne State University chapter of the American Association of University Professors. Professor Parrish, welcome. Thank you for joining us. So, as you can tell, it's a, a very impressive panel based on their accomplishments, but at Wayne State, it's also an impressive panel because this is, in many ways, the leadership we have at Wayne State. We have the provost, we have the president of the academic senate, and we have the president of the faculty at that union. And, and at the beginning of the year, as, as where we are now, it's, uh, it's appropriate for us to have a chance to hear from each one where they think the university is going this year and into the near future and where they'd like to see it go, and what maybe stands in the way of accomplishing those objectives. And I'd like to start with Provost Whitfield, if you'd like. <laughs> well, what did you expect? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I should have expected that. Well, well, first and foremost, um, thank you very much for your time, for inviting me to come. Um, I have been so looking forward to the beginning of the semester because basically over the summertime, I just got to hang out with these two guys. And it was only just seeing part of the faculty that I know that we have so many excellent faculty at this university. Um, I just wanted to get as many opportunities to be able to interact with you as possible. Uh, so things like this, I move everything around on my schedule to, to try to make an attempt. Um, so your three questions were, where are we going? What was the other one? Where, where, where would you like us? Where are we now? And where are we going in relation to that? And uh, so where, where would you like us to be in a year from now or near the future? And then what do you see as the major challenges in getting there? See, they're already clapping for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just passed 90 days. I don't think I'm at 120 days yet. Um, and uh, it, it's amazing learning as much as I have been learning about this university. Um, a lot of my suspicions were confirmed. Uh, I do like to tell people, I, you know, I had a perfectly good job. I didn't need to go anywhere. You know, they weren't kicking me out. I wasn't being rode out, really out on a rail. Um, but looking at the opportunity for a, a university that I think is absolutely perfectly poised to make a significant impact on students who, um, I have told students this, and I, I'm, I've noticed I need to be more careful about what I say about how well, I did in school when I was a student, but there are students who are like me, uh, who weren't necessarily at the top of their class, who needed a transformative experience, and I see this as a place that can do that. I see this as a place that is doing that. Um, and the more I learn, the more I get more and more questions uh, about how we can do it better. Uh, so in terms of where we're going, um, you know, lots of our indicators, they're not, they're not jumping up by 100%, some of them are even ticking down a little bit, but those are, those are more kind of little cohort sorts of things. I think that we've got lots of things in place that are actually going to put the kinds of things that are important to both faculty and students in place. Um, it's just going to take a little time, and it's going to take a lot of dedication. Um, from the faculty that I've met, and I know that they're still a select group, um, there's incredible dedication. Actually, uh, I'm glad that you gave uh, a hand of applause to these two gentlemen. Uh, because it's clear to me the years of dedication that they've had to try to make this the best place that it can be. 
And that's basically what faculty are. Faculty are the lifeblood of the university. Um, I also like to say that one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing that we need to focus on in the future is student success. Of course, we've been focusing on the past. Time to just double down and focus on the future. And um, I want to just make it clear, at least from my perspective, that student success is really faculty success. That, you know, we can talk about all the different kinds of things under the administration that we do for student support services. If we don't have faculty involved, committed to that success, it really doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Um, in the springtime, we're going to be uh, starting up EAD as a place that's going to give us data on different things that are going on with our students. And I just came from a meeting and talking about that, and, and my last word to them is, is that, you know, where are the faculty in this? The faculty are really a piece of that success. Don't think about just where we can send students to. The students are going to be successful when they connect with our faculty. And we have to figure out how that's a piece of the advising that we do. So uh, I do have three or four things that uh, in the short period of time that I've been here, um, I don't think that they're earth shattering. They're things that are in our strategic plan. There are things that we've been talking about. Um, I think what you have is just a new, fresh set of legs that will help to run the race towards trying to achieve some of these goals. Um, one is academic success uh, for our students. Um, and what does that mean? I don't like them, but we have to live with them, and they're the metrics of four-year and six-year graduation rates. Um, we can have a long, long talk about uh, how we can actually improve them and why they are where they're at. But those are going to be metrics that we'll try to improve. Um, I think also having deeper student engagement. Um, you all have lived there and seen this university change. But for somebody who's newer to it, although I've been coming to the Institute for Gerontology for almost 20 years, but usually only one side of the campus. Um, we're in a commuter campus, but we're not a commuter campus. We actually have a ton of students that are very, very near here. And one of the things that I've observed is that there's lots of students here now on the weekends, and I've heard that that's a, that's a newer phenomenon than, than before. Uh, that kind of engagement in the campus so that they get the sense of an academic environment is critically important. Um, and the, in the same way that the students need to be engaged, the faculty need to be engaged. And so um, part of that comes in part from recognizing and trying to promote faculty success, um, whether it be for making sure that our junior faculty have the things that they need to be able to successfully um, do the things that are required for tenure, um, or also being able to make sure that we highlight the strength of the faculty that we have. That's one of my bigger observations is, is that there's a lot of really good things going on here that only certain people know about. And it's that we do not have a, a clear enough footprint about how we, we view our successes. Uh, in the FAB building, I love it because we have these posters that go up about research and about teaching excellence, um, but I don't get enough around the campus. I don't know whether those are shown anyplace else. So we've got to figure out some ways to make sure uh, that we support faculty success as well as uh, celebrating faculty success. A couple of other things that are high on my list and high in, on my interest, and these are things too that we actually have the capacity to do, that we're doing them, but we're not doing them actually taking the parts and making them a whole. Um, one is, is innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, there is a lot of outside opportunities for funding uh, innovation and entrepreneurship that I think if we actually brought the resources across business, across engineering, across uh, class, across performing arts actually together, there's some very, very exciting things that can be done by harnessing the capacity that's spread out in the i &E world across those different units. The same thing exists for big data, which is another, you know, it's kind of got a cliche-ish uh, uh, aura about it these days. Um, but there's so much happening even in the city. When I think, I live downtown on Woodward. I figured it was just easy. I couldn't get lost if I just got on Woodward and drove down. So I live all the way downtown, and when I look at the M1, and I start thinking about all of the data that the M1 will have, um, somebody who does, does urban planning would love to see that. How is it going to change um, the distribution of the population in the city of Durham? Or, city of Durham, sorry. <laughs> we don't have tobacco here. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> we, ha we have it, you just don't grow it. Um, in, the, in, the, other things in, well. in the city of Detroit, how are those things going to change? How is it going to change? You know, we've got the, 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 the other interesting layered complication of that we're trying to start a transit authority. How are those things going to come together to work 
and what does that mean in terms of distribution of population, the distribution of wealth? There's, there's, I'm a simple-minded guy. There's thousands of questions that people could be asking that are going to be driven by data that's going to basically be sitting there. And I think we've got some great folks who are starting to do some of those parts and pieces and to bring them together to think about how we can work as a whole uh, to really be able to contribute both to the knowledge about what's going on in our city and to guide what's going on in terms of our city. So it helps to make Wayne State then the leader. Uh, I would say lastly that one overarching connection that needs to be made that lots of you all have been doing, but again, I feel sometimes like it's been part of peace, and that's a better connection to our community. Um, this university, I mean, it's one of the things that attract me about this university. This is an urban serving research one institution. There are very few that actually have the prestige that this university has. But that is a, a balancing act that's difficult to do. And so um, trying to figure out ways to actually then highlight and capitalize on that connection that we have to our city um, and ways in which we can actually make it better with the great minds and, and with the people that we have here. Uh, that's another foci of some of the things that I spend some of my time doing uh, in addition to just keeping the rest of the trains running. So I think I'll stop there. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Provost uh, Whitfield. And I guess we'll go to uh, Professor Romano. Hello. Well, first, thank you for that very nice introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so I actually looked at the topic of this forum, which was my vision for Wayne State. And I think I'll think, stick to that rather than going over your questions, because it's the first time I've ever been asked what my vision is for Wayne State. I've been here 36 years, and, and no one's ever asked me that. Uh, we ask administrators that all the time. <laughs> that's, how, that, that's when they come to interview and say, what's your vision? And, and we expect them to be very informative and, and very uh, imaginative about what they want to do. <clears throat> so I thought it would be fun for me to you know, talk, say what my vision is for Wayne State. Now Charlie and I often stick around after the policy committee meetings and, and I pound on the table and I said, I wish I wish I could be, you know, in charge of this madhouse for six months. <laughs> I said I could I could fix it, but but, but most of my fantasies involve firing people. So. <laughs> serious of, you know, what, what actually could we do to, to make, uh, well, what is my vision and what can we do to achieve that vision? So my vision is, and, and it's always been since, um, since I, I realized that I, you know, there was more to the university than just being in my lab and doing research, that there was a lot of smart people out here and this was a pretty good place to be. Um, and <clears throat> I, I, I always thought that Wayne State could be the the premier uh, urban research university in the country. I really thought that we could move towards that. And sometimes we do move forward towards that. And sometimes we move back. And I'm not sure if we're inching forward or, or standing still or moving backwards. It's, it's hard to tell. But all I can say is we're not moving very fast towards that goal. And I, and I wish, we, wish we could. Um, so it's easy to have a vision. Those are easy words to say. Just like a lot of the things that are in our strategic plan are, are easy to say. The problem is that you have to really figure out a path way to get to these really important goals. And, um, and that's the hard part. So I was going to, I thought about what, I could talk about a million things on, on that topic, but I, I thought the three most important in my mind are. Enhancing student enrollment and retention, uh, enhancing research funding, and setting the proper budget priorities. In my mind, I think those are the three most important things. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to increase enrollment just so we can say you know, we have 30,000 students or 40,000 students. The, the reason I think that enrollment is important and retention for the same reason, but for other reasons that I'll talk about, is. <clears throat> important because that's the only way we're going to get more budget. We are, we are not going to get more money from the state. It's going to be about what inflation is. Sometimes, and sometimes less because they don't seem to like as much in Lansing. Um, we can get more development money, but donors 
tell you what they want the money to go to. You can't use it for anything. It's, we want you to use it for this, and there are rules, so you really are stuck with that. Um, research funding could improve a lot, but you know the ICR money that we get, the indirect cost money that grants give us, is not enough to pay for what the university puts out to do the research. It, research is usually a losing proposition. As is, uh, you know, the money that we put towards, um, you know, entrepreneurship and developing new products and patents and so forth, we probably lose money on those deals. You know, even though it'd be nice to get a, you know, massive strike, but those are rare. So the only way I see it to, to really get more budget, which is what we need to achieve everything that we want in the university, right? We want to have a great university. We need more budget. We need buildings. We need new programs, we need to hire new faculty. It, it's going to take money to do that, and the only way we can get more money uh, is to get more students. Uh, we're not going to be able to increase tuition rates because the, the legislature now controls that. So, um, so the, also we could get have more students if we had better retention. So if we could keep more of the students that we had and not have them dropping out, of them drop out about per year. So uh, that's why um, the metric of um, six-year graduation may be artificial and may not be important in terms of our, you know, our overall graduation rate. But it is a fixed point, and it, if you see it moving up or down, it makes a difference, right? It, it's relative to what it is. So if it's moving down or staying the same, that's not good. We want it to move up. We want to have a better six-year the state and the federal government looks at that number. Um, I don't think they should look at it in absolute the terms. They should look at it as a delta function. Is it moving up in the right direction? Yeah. And I'll get back to that. <clears throat> so uh, enrollment, how do we get more money, get more students, get more tuition revenue? Um, you, know, you, you would think that with everything that's going right, right in Detroit right now, we're out of bankruptcy. There's a lot of good things happening. There's good buzz all over the country. We get good articles. You would think that students would be pounding down our doors. I don't know why they're not. I, mean, I don't think we market the university correctly. And I think we need to do a better job of that. If it were me, I'd hire a firm to do it. A professional firm. Somebody that really knows how to market something and do ads. And I look at our billboards and I think they're ugly. And I mean, other people must also. So we got to do a better job of that. Um, we need to we need to <clears throat> we need to market specifically to certain groups. The same ad can't be used in the suburbs as is used here. So you need different advertising out state, um, uh, different ad ad advertising out of the state. So all of those things I think thought about. I think we need to do a better job with social media. If they say that we're doing using social media. I don't know. I think we need to bring more students to campus. <clears throat> so we have an AP day where some of our best students come to campus, but we need to do more of that. Um, we suggested, I suggested about three years ago, maybe more, that we have a science day where we bring um, students from all over the state to campus to look at the great science that we're doing here. And I think that may finally happen this year, although I'm not sure if it will. I think it's going to be a STEM day. Be a step good. Like um, right. Roses and daisies. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we need to do more of that. I think we need to get more students on campus. I think um, we need to do better targeting of financial aid. I think our financial aid could be used to bring students in as well as to help students graduate. Um, you know, target financial aid more. I know we do a little bit, but really target more the students who are struggling to graduate to take that last class. Um, and I think somehow we need to bring in out-of-state students. Our market is shrinking here in Metro Southeast Michigan, and we need to expand our market. And two ways to do that are out-of-state and out-of-state, and I think we need to really market our programs better. And we have some great programs, and, and that should be part of the advertising. Um, so retention. So retention has been going up for the last, since I guess, 2000.
2011, it's up to 12 percent, and, that, and that's great. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, if you go back three years and do it from uh, 2008, we're only at 4 percent. So there was a big dip, and now we're coming out of the dip and going up, and that's part of the 12 percent increase. That's not to say that the increase isn't great, but uh, ho hopefully we can do better. <coughs> And I think we have a lot of programs now in place that are going to, is going to help with retention uh, because it is a metric the state looks at, right, to decide on how much money to give us, uh, as well as it's a badge of honor, right? We can't be a great research university if we have a 30% six-year graduation rate. Everybody looks at that. We can't be a great urban research university if we have a 12% six-year graduation rate for African Americans. I mean. We're going to be at a great urban university and we can't graduate our, our, our minority students. I mean, it's a disgrace. So we need to fix that. But um, as I said, we have a lot of good things in place. As the provost said, we have EAB, this new firm that we've contracted with. By the way, the policy committee pushed that through, <laughs> kicking and screaming from the last administration. But finally, they agreed to do it, and uh, we think it's going to be a good, good thing. We also have a lot of new advisors uh, who we think are going to help students get through and graduate, advise them on which courses to take and how many courses to take and maybe what majors to get into. Um, one thing we think could help with retention and graduation rate is to figure out the best tuition um, policy. Because right now we charge the same tuition for the first credit you take and the last credit you take. And a lot of schools don't do that. Some schools, you know, private schools, you pay a certain speed. You can take as many credits as you want. Um, a lot of public schools uh, give a discount when you get over 12 credits. And that encourages students to take more credits. Um, and it could be used as a model here. Uh, again, if you're taking more credits, uh, it might bring you more revenue, and it also might um, get people out of here. Yeah, get people to graduate faster. OK, research funding. <coughs> So, again, I don't think we can be a great research university if we don't have a high level of funding. I, I know there's lots of other kind of researches, research that we do, and I'm very sympathetic to all those in the humanities and the arts who can't get funded and social sciences who get smaller grants, but, you know, universities are ranked by how much money they bring in. I mean, that's the ranking that you look in the, in the in the, you know, the um, NSF and the NIH web pages, the, the universities are ranked by their um, overall R&D expenditures. So, and our overall R&D expenditures have, have been dropping for the past 10 years. So for uh, all universities, we dropped from the 72nd in uh, about 10 years ago or, or more, I think it, the last listing I could find was we went to 96, from 72 to 96 in 2015. <clears throat> so, so we're going in the wrong direction. We need to change that. We need to reverse that decline and bring in more research funding. Now I can tell you what's not going to fix it is a hope that iBio is going to be some magical, you know, it's, you know, magnet for bringing in, you know, hundreds of great researchers. It, it's just not going to work. I mean, it, it was, it's positioned in the wrong place. It's very hard to attract people to go there uh, because it's so far from our medical school. The idea was to have collaborations between basic researchers and clinicians. And how do you do that when the med school is a mile and a half away? I mean, it, it, it's not going to work. Um, they, they'll get some some faculty. I think it, you know it certainly has the potential, but it's going to be a slow process. It's not going to happen. Um, one thing the president has said is that he wants this faculty not to save money on their research grants to spend it right away. That would that would up the spending, and, and it would. But it's not faculty are not going to do that. I mean, we're worried about you know what happens when this grant ends and it's going to take me a year to get the next grant. I need money to pay my people during that time. I can't be without funds. So you're not going to just say give up my lab for a year and then when I get the grant I'll start up again. 
So the university wants us to spend that money right away. We need to have a safety net, a real safety net, not a <coughs> not something that's going to pay us twenty-five thousand dollars. That, that's not enough because our students and supplies cost a lot more than that. Um, and uh, certainly, it's not going to fix the funding levels by um, having the university force the medical school to put their salaries on their grants. I mean, that's probably good for the medical school's budget, but it's not going to increase our funding levels. <coughs> so, <coughs> be very quick now, I know. So I think we need to encourage more grant submissions. I, I mean, all this talk about medical school people have to submit more grants. Did you know that they submitted less grants this year than they did last year? I mean, something was just not... Morale's bad in the, in the med school, and, and I think that's one of the results that people are saying, I, I'm not good. They want me to pursue more grants, I'm not going to. Or maybe there's fewer faculty. I don't know. But they did go down. I was surprised. Um, so, you know, one way to do it, which we've often suggested, is to give a bonus if a person gives, gets a second grant. So not, not if they put part of their salary on their grant, but you get a second grant, we're going to give you a bonus. And a lot of schools do that, you know, where, you, where you get a second grant um, and, um, and, and you get a $10,000 bonus or something to really encourage faculty because we don't have a tradition here of applying for multiple most schools at John Hopkins at Harvard, I mean, these people, they have their names on five or six grants. It's, it's not the tradition here. We need to change that. I think we have to uh, try to get collaborations between funded and unfunded faculty. So faculty who have lost their grants and have become a little research and active. We need to get those people together with funded faculty to get them to do new research. <coughs> so change their perspective, learn new things, so they can apply for grants. You can't have, you know, a hundred, I'm going to die. Yeah, two was not, was not feeling well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we can't, we can't have, that's for you to know since you're sitting there. We can't have, <laughs> <laughs> we can't have 50 <laughs> or a hundred, you know, faculty who oh, should be funded yeah. and are 40 or 50 years old not being funded. I mean, those people have to be turned around. That's one way to do it. <coughs> Can you conclude, Lou? So. Yeah, I'm not finished right now. Um, I'll, I'll skip to the last one. I need, we, I, we need to get um, coordinated hiring. So we need to hire groups of faculty who work on the same project. And that's going to take coordination between the research office and the provost office. We need to figure out what areas to hire in, which is the hard part. And they go out and find people who are doing those studies in that area and hire them as a group because that will bring them here because they want to be in the group and it will allow us to get program projects, center grants, training grants, which is what we need. All right, I'll stop. So thank you very much for your interest. <laughs> <laughs>
all across the university. And the reason we did that was because uh, Michigan State had suddenly decided that they had an urban college. And uh, the president, George Yellen, was almost that all panicked and decided we really did need something urban at the urban at the university in the middle of Detroit. And so we created uh, an urban I wrote the administrative structure, and Ross wrote the philosophy. And the administrative structure created a vice president of urban labor and metropolitan affairs. And the shorthand was urban was black, uh, metropolitan was suburb, and labor was labor. And we tried to mash them all together. We got all the centers that weren't under weren't under uh, that were. Uh, looked into this kind of related to this, we brought them together under the vice president for labor. And so we've struggled with this problem all this time. We've never fully been able to mesh our role as the urban university, looking at Detroit, seeing its problems, the problems of metropolitan Detroit. We didn't, a lot of people didn't define urban as the metropolitan area, unfortunately. Uh, I think that's something we need to do more and more. But I think that our struggle has been really one that, that has had many herb pushes and shoves and back and forth and so on. I've seen this come and go. I've seen uh, the many administrators come and go here. All of whom were committed to these kinds of things, but all of them had somewhat different uh, visions. But Roy, I think Roy is, Roy kind of gets it. I think he wants to have a University that is uh, that is committed to the overall urban effort, in a broader kind of way, committed to undergraduates and committed to be a first-rate research institution. Being a first-rate research institution means a medical school that functions, a medical school that's highly professional, a medical school that produces research. Because without the research in the medical school, we would not be a research one year. That's what gets us there. Now, the problems now uh, are headaches that I never expected when I got involved uh, after Adam and fired me. Uh, when I got involved in, uh, in the union. And I didn't think that at this late date, uh, I'm not exactly an elder statesman, but I didn't expect that I would have pushing 100 meetings with individual faculty a number of whom uh, are having their tenure attacked in the medical school. And uh, what that is and so on is a real, it's a real problem. And the problem is one that I'm not sure what the outcome is going to be. For some, uh, uh, Dr. Cruz O'Brien was writing about Northern Ireland and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Palestinian issue. He said some problems have outcomes. They don't have solutions. And I hope that we're going to be able to get a solution in the near future for the medical school. I'm not completely optimistic at this stage. I think that people with good sense uh, all, from all directions are trying to provide leadership. Uh, we have, uh, in this latest push, in which 40 some members of the faculty were identified as people who were quote unproductive. Some of these people were very productive in ways and not in bringing a research grant. <coughs> now, one faculty member that I know who was, uh, who was taking a retirement buyout virtually ran the, was the key person for the graduate program over there. And the graduate program is an integral part of what the research operation of medical school is. This is a, uh, we brought in a, uh, uh, David Hefner and David and his say this couple of hired guns are going to be here for a year and a half and say this is the way every this is the way medical schools ought to be and, they, and they've had a big they're basically running the medical school right now. Uh, the question of whether or not we're going to come out of this hole is really a difficult it's a difficult issue. Uh, the uh, uh, but it's a broad it's a broad issue that that is that has good medical schools that have address these kinds of things in a longer period of time. The greatest basic problem was the previous administration did not really address the problems that, that have come before at this stage. 
uh, the aggressive thing is, period of time is that uh, medical schools are research institutions. They are known and that their prestige from being on the research grant uh, list, high on it, and getting your money from NIH. It's a real problem because uh, the, the NIH money is not easy to get. Cuts and the cuts and shifts in priorities at the national level and NIH have uh, really resulted in, uh, in many fewer grants available to researchers. Uh, but the absolute facts are that if you look at the uh, if you look at the record, those people, we give people tenure now. At least this is the, the standard uh, that we are enunciating. That if a person gets an R01, which is the prestigious uh, research grant, that this is for the key to getting tenure. Well, 50% of those people who get an R01 never get another one. Few of them, actually very few, uh, active apply for others. It's something that's really a, a difficult. And I think if you're sitting here and you're looking at uh, someone who is, uh, gets an R01 at the age of 45, assistant professor in, uh, in anatomy, and gets a, gets a research grant, and she gets, her, uh, she gets tenure, and then she's in her 50s, and she's not able to get another grant. What do you do with people? How do you make them part of the organization? Organization, the organization is only made up of those people who are there, who are here. It's, uh, the faculty doesn't think much about the academic staff. The academic staff, without the academic staff, I don't know where this university would be. I just don't know. We, we, aren't, we don't have alternative things that are valued for faculty who are not uh, producing research in those kinds of things to do. We have a lot of big issues, but right now we're completely embroiled in this personnel business and in the, uh, there are now big tenure revocations going forward. We hear there are going to be 11. Uh, there are 40 people identified, 11, 18 people have been given buyouts. Uh, and negotiations, which we, we negotiate, our lawyers negotiate most of them. Uh, we're trying to soften this transition and change as best we can within the contract, within the terms of collective bargaining. The basics of collective bargaining that we have to protect is the right of every person who is a member of the bargaining unit to due process. That's, a, that's the basic right that everybody that a member of the union should have. Members of the bargaining unit, because we represent those people who choose not to join the union and they offer money to a scholarship fund or they're an agency fee, which we will have until, until uh, 2021 when our contract runs out and we're governed by right to work and people don't have to join the union. But we have to represent all of those people anyway. We represent those people who, who after 2021, if they decide we're not going to be a member of the union, they have to be represented. It's the obligate, the legal obligation. And so looking at that, I'm, I've maybe become a little bit pessimistic at times when I, because talking to having a hundred or so interviews with people who are being told that they're unproductive and with many of them who say, well, I come in and I, and I do all these kinds of things and I go home tired every day. Uh, but they said, it doesn't make any difference whether you have a grant. Well, it's a growing pain. And I hope that the, the medical school gets through it. Through with it. I have great respect for Jack Sobel. I think as a person, he's a very honest and decent man. But I think that he, that he, he as the dean of medicine, has caught up in a lot of elements that, I, that, are, that are really very, very difficult. Sorry, can I ask you to conclude? So yeah, okay. Okay. I get wound up on this one. The last point is, don't expect that when an administration gets in the habit of attacking tenure in the medical school, that they're not going to think, they're not going to be people who will be working to attack tenure in the rest of the university. And I just reviewed uh, a, uh, a review by, uh, a, a piece by uh, Mike McIntyre, who died 
far too uh, young. Uh, but his his response, he he wrote a, a thing on tenure in the medical tenure at the university when the when the last administration uh, offered the most despicable tenure proposal in which they could take the tenure of people <coughs> and the ESS from people in one day. And their proposal, there was no role for the union until after they'd been fired. Now, you know, it's one thing to talk about wonders of what we can do and the future and all these other things. But unless the people who are in the organization to do this, uh, unless they have basic rights and they uh, understand that they're being treated fairly, uh, that you're just not going to get very far. Let me just read briefly this thing and then I'll, and then I'll end with this. Mike writes here, he says, what happens to a university that shows contempt for basic academic values by eliminating tenure? We do not know for sure, but for no serious research institution has ever gone down that path. It was proposed that we went down that path by the last administration, and we remember. But it is not difficult to predict what is likely to happen. First, the university would always immediately lose the ability to attract high qualified new faculty. Why would a highly qualified recruited scholar pick a university that's taken tenure with its basic guarantee of academic freedom away from the faculty? when all its other employment options, and all the other employment options come with a guarantee of tenure or the possibility of achieving tenure. Tenure really matters. Few faculty members take it lightly. Few, if any, would fail to view negatively a university that abolished it. Well, you don't have to completely abolish it, but we did get the reputation across the country for a university that proposed to abolish it, the university. And so I think we have to proceed very carefully in this area. In terms of my vision for the university, is that I hope we don't have to have this fight all the way across the university. Uh, Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> all right, so we heard quite a bit of a big dose of bad news altogether, I think. Uh, but that's, I think, because we have high expectations of the university and we'd like it to be, you know, what, where, uh, a place that we all have in our mind as an ideal place to do research and to live and, and uh, be with others. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, we can take probably two. If there are questions, please keep them short, and I'll ask panelists to also brief, be brief in your responses to so we can get to the Are there any questions? No questions? Um. Uh, my name is Solarini at Hanoi, and I'm over in the College of Education. I, I really want to thank all three members of the panel for coming and expressing uh, ideas about your vision for this university. I've been here 23 years, and I have never heard uh, anyone speak about um, assistance for those who have no career path, who aren't doing research. And I want to also add, for those who are only doing research, there is no career path. And I happen to be one of those individuals. Um, I think. Uh, provost, your um, focusing in on the graduation rates and the tie to faculty um, and students that there is a uh, inexorable tie there. A lot of times, in my humble opinion, we get very caught up on all the things that we can build facilities and so forth, but the tie is really to the human beings at this institution. Students connect with faculty. They connect with advisors. They connect with janitors. They connect with people. The bricks and water are important and they're lovely, but until we can really hone in on to the hearts of our people and let them know that these students have to be reinforce their, their value to the institution is, this is our reason for being, <coughs> is to enable them. So I really appreciate you focusing in on that. And <clears throat> I would just say that um, uh, I like, uh, uh, Professor Romano, your, your ideas that um, uh, we have to look forward to increasing the budget 
uh, because it is not going to be state funding. We really, uh, and folk, and faculty have to understand, I spent a long time working at state government, and I have a clear understanding that that, even the formula, yes, I know it's a, uh, it's a terrible formula the way that they, they set it up for the state university, but the large majority of funding is going to continue to diminish unless we do something politically. Uh, so I'll just say that. Thank you so much for all of you. Is that a quick question? A yeah. big question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nicholas Rivera. I'm one of the uh, admissions counselors from the Department of Undergraduate Admissions. And I just had a question when we're talking about retention and, and gaining in more students and everything like that. And the main question I'm, I'm having is, is what we all know is already is the budget constraints that we're having. Um, when we're talking about gaining more students, the big question we're having is, how are we going to get the, the staff to do that? Currently in the admissions office, we're understaffed and we don't have the funding to do any of these special programs that a lot of people are requesting from us. Um, when we're talking about special programs like the STEM day and everything else like that, we're, we're putting on all these events, but we're not getting the help from the departments that we're currently recruiting, per se, for them. And I'm not talking about a staff perspective, I'm, I'm just talking about a, a financial constraint that we're, that we're dealing with. So then the second part comes with the um, out-of-state students that, that a lot of people talk about, and I'm, and I'm not meaning this to target you, but um, where are we going to put them? When we get these out-of-state students, they've got to live somewhere. And on our campus, we, we've got this housing issue that we're slowly starting to realize. And we're doing all this construction and building this new building and everything like that, but we're only getting 600 beds. So where would we put these students if we were going to recruit out-of-state? Where, where would you all propose that we would, how we would uh, fix these issues in terms of funding for recruitment and stuff? Thank you for your question, but uh, since we're running out of time, I'm going to ask Provost Whitfield to just answer the question as well as if you'd like to close, close it with your comments as well. Um, you could have been in three meetings that I was in yesterday where we're asking some of those same questions. That we can have goals, but um, some of them we need to actually take a step back and, and think about how we're going, actually going to get there. Um, you know, there there is plans for new housing to go up, but you know, for the 3,000, roughly 3,000 students we're thinking about, they're not 3,000 beds that are there. Uh, our ecosystem around this university is changing, but I don't know if it's changing to the tune of that. And so, um, and, and actually, I think, again, to your point, um, it's, a, it's a question that I asked yesterday, which was, we talked about having 3,000 students, but where are those students supposed to be? Is that, is that class that's gonna grow by 3,000? Is it the medical? Where actually will they be? And we've not, We've, we've set a goal that we haven't necessarily put out a bunch of specific um, targets for how we'll actually uh, meet those goals. And so um, I can tell you that some of that conversation that's going on, I think the kinds of interactions that we're having today actually help keep the administration uh, thinking about it, but the faculty have to think about it as well. Uh, because to some degree, to uh, some of the points that uh, Professor Romano made, uh, uh, some of that is changing cultures even that are in departments that's necessary for some of the things that, that he was suggesting. And those would be positive things, but those are things then that we have to kind of set as a goal and be able to figure out how we can actually make some of those changes. So, um, you know, I'm a little younger than these gentlemen. Uh, only a little. <coughs> and, and, and probably only in body and not in spirit. Um, but I can tell you from somebody who's coming recently from the outside, some of the things that we're struggling with, these are not unique to Wayne. Uh, these are things that are going on in higher ed. For example, the, the lack of support from, from state funding. Um, you know, those are things that everyone is having to deal with and everyone is taking different approaches to be able to do it. Um, there's lots and lots of ideas. We need to try out the ones that we think best fit for Wayne. Um, and some of them are gonna work and some of them aren't going to work. Uh, but I think that what is really required is to make sure that we don't have what I, I took from, from both of these gentlemen's comments uh, in, in part about some of the history that's gone in the past. And that is the idea that there's two different parts or three or four different parts of the university and that they're all working differently. Um, you know, in, in my mind, I'm somebody who has been involved in faculty governance since I was just a wee little assistant professor. And so in my mind, there's a great amount of value that's there, but that conversation has to go back and forth um, there needs to be times when two 
administration just listens and doesn't think about doing the leading that they have to do. Um, having opportunities to be able to share with you like this informs me. I mean, I'm going to go back and, and restate some of uh, these points. And, and I, uh, I've listened to Lou talk uh, about the cluster hiring several times. And uh, there might be some possibilities for that. And it's just something I'm going to follow up on. But I can't promise every single, single thing that someone says I'm going to do. But, you know, these are things that are going to develop. We, we have a new university in a lot of ways. We have new leadership. Uh, part of the reason why I came here was the president. Like I said, I had a great cushy job. I took the summers off. I worked all summer, believe you me, uh, this year. Um, but partly it was seeing a, a, a university president that had a clear vision that I thought matched what the mission should be for this university. And that he was trying to do the kinds of things that needed to be done uh, to be able to make this university as great as it, 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 the actual potential is there. So, um, you know, it's so difficult. Actually, Charlie reminds me, he sits next to me in policy committee all the time, and he talks about how many provosts have come through here. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't, I've, I've had 20. I don't, know whether, I don't know whether he's suggesting that I need to pack my bags or what. Um, Just don't unpack all of them. <laughs> I'll keep the boxes. Um, but, but my goal and my hope is, is that we, you and I have a, a long tenure together, however long it is, and that I'm committed to trying to make sure that we find ways to be able to use all the resources we have, both intellectual, uh, in terms of the personnel, um, what you're talking about in terms of the manpower issue, you know, some of that is is making sure that, that we work as a whole and not just parts, because the parts by themselves are not strong enough to stand. And it's, it's part of the reason why we have some of the financial problems that we have. We're actually not working together as a faculty, together as a university. And so, you know, some of that are platitudes, but some of that is what you're going to see as, as real things that are going to help the university move forward. So, um, you know, be encouraged. I think that's what I would leave you with, is be encouraged and be renewed. Thank you. On that hopeful note,